Hello, hello. Oh. I'll, put, I'll put the mic over here. Hello, everyone. Everyone have a good lunch? En enjoying Show Me Con thus far? Well, we have for you a fantastic speaker to my right here. Uh, I saw him for the first time in ArchCon last year. Uh, significant amount of experience within uh, the PCI compliance space and credit cards and tokens or soft tokens, and he'll get into all that within his talk. But uh, Tim Malcolm Vetter is currently the director of the red team at little chain of stores uh, called Walmart, Atal. Um, so give it up for Tim Malcolm Vetter. Thanks. Am I on? Hey, you guys still hear me okay? There we go. Cool. Uh, well, welcome to the Show Me State, right? Show me your tokens, and I'll show you your credit cards. It's the theme of the talk today. So, uh, about me, uh, my name's Tim. Um, I'm local, uh, born and raised in St. Louis, so, right? Uh, we got, okay, there we go. Thought there may be, be a few more of you that are at least from here, right? Uh, I've got 15 years in IT, I uh, did the Deventer roles like a lot of you guys. Uh, I've been a builder, wrote software, led dev teams, uh, and the last few years have focused entirely on breaking on the offense side. Um, currently, like you said, I'm the uh, director of the red team at Fortune 1, world's largest company. Uh, or like how, how we like to refer to ourselves internally is we're the uh, advanced persistent threat inside the 25th largest economy if you took our revenue and compared us to, you know, like we're right there after like Sweden. But uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, <clears throat> I've been a presenter at uh, Black and Arsenal, besides ArchCon here, last a couple other places, dev, co co uh, dev conferences as well. I uh, spent a lot of time in school, way too much time actually, including uh, a handful of the University, University of Missouri campuses, uh, including Kansas City and Rolla. Um, and of course, I've got Alphabet Soup and I got some CVEs if you're into that sort of thing. So, a couple disclaimers to get us kicked off real quick. This is courtesy of my employer. Uh, all of my opinions here are mine, they're not theirs. Uh, nothing in this content uh, also today re uh, reflects upon my employer. This is all stuff back when I was a consultant before with previous merchants. There you go. So, disclaimers out of the way. Here's our agenda. So, we're going to be talking about truncation versus tokenization, uh, what the heck that is. Uh, then, we're going to dig into the, a handful of these attacks. And we're going to try, I'm trying something new with these slides. We're going to do a lot of content really fast, a little bit at a time, because it's after lunch. And I know after lunch is the time that everybody gets sleepy and the whole metabolic thing, right? So, we're going to, we're going to, I'm gonna do my best to keep you awake, right? So, first of all, how many people in here are, would you uh, consider yourself like a defender, your defender role? Okay, I'd figure probably the majority. How many of you are builders? You build systems, you build software, architects? Okay, got a handful of you guys do that too, probably some crossover. Um, how many are breakers? So you'd actually consider yourself on the offense side. Okay, we got, cool, all right, good. Um, how many of you guys have actually implemented credit card tokenization before? Handful. Maybe three or four. And how many are you not sure if your credit cards at your company are tokenized or not? You have no idea. That's actually, usually that's a, the bigger category. Okay, well, anyway. So, truncation versus tokenization. As you see here uh, up from St. Louis, we gotta have some nice St. Louis themed stuff, and as we get through, the arch will get bigger and better. Um, but, you know, obviously we have credit cards, right? And credit card tokenization, or truncation is basically taking that six digits in the middle and blacking it out, so we can't see those. Uh, because, uh, a credit card, if you break it down, it's a little harder to see on the screen than I would like. Um, you've got basically an issuer, a bank ID, an account number in the middle, and the account number is kind of the part we're trying to abstract out, and we've got this nice little check digit. So when I saw this, I thought, hey, how hard in the world is it to actually calculate those missing digits? But it turns out, you know, there's six of them. There's ten possible char uh, characters that go in there, right? That's ten to six power, right? Basic math. That means a million cases, or a million guesses, worst case, or 500,000 in the average case, right? Doesn't sound all that hard, but it turns out that there's a little thing called the Loon algorithm. If you've never heard of it, it's also known as the Mod 10 rule, which basically means that that whole last digit there, that's a check digit. So by doing that, it actually takes it down an order of magnitude, right? So we're actually looking at 10 to the fifth power, 100,000 guesses in the worst case, or 50,000 on average, right? That's, that's terribly easy to brute force offline, right? If you want to generate that, line, a couple lines of Python can generate all of those cards for a given first and last uh, inside of like a two seconds or less on an average computer, right? It's really fast. And yet, PCI strangely allows uh, storage of these truncated PANs, or primary account numbers, right? So the question is, why in the world do they allow that? And so you can go, you know, obviously this is not a PCI-specific talk. I'm not a QSA, never was, never want to be. Uh, but if you want to go look into this, there's a nice little warning that they gave you on 3.4. That's your homework to take away. And after the talk, maybe you'll really be scratching your head. 
So the question is, okay, so if that's what truncation is, what, what do tokens look like? And, and if you've never seen tokens, they're typically derived values off that original credit card number, right? So it could be something like a hash, uh, you know, just some random string that doesn't, it looks like garbage to us. Uh, it could be substitution. This is really popular in the early days of uh, tokenization, back when we had legacy point of sale systems, and we still needed to fit this number inside the 16 digit space, still needed to satisfy the loon check and all that jazz, but it had to be a different number than the original. So you see in this case, 4716 instead of 4111. Right. Uh, it could be a, just a database ID or a GUID. This is actually really common, especially with e-commerce, uh, just to get this big, nasty, long, really random str uh, string that's really hard to guess. Right. Or it can be encrypted. In this case, just some random base 64 set of bytes, and you look at that and you go, oh, okay, that's pretty much garbage, right? I can't, I don't know what it is. Run it through your favorite base 64 decoder, it still is just some random array of bytes. So the question is, if it's encrypted, where are the keys, right? That's the only thing that always pops in my head every, every time I see something like that. So, but for today, we're going to talk about uh, just enterprise targets as our scope. So when I say enterprise targets, uh, I, I literally mean, you know, kind of the role you're on. Do it yourself, uh, self-hosted tokenization, and this is really for large-scale retail or e-commerce, right? So this is not payment uh, clearing houses or gateways, even though, uh, as we'll dig into this, you might find that some of the same principles actually apply uh, to, to and carry over to those same providers and suppliers. The other thing to note, so we're not going to attack crypto. This is no, there's no math required in there. I gave you all the math you're going to have at the beginning with the whole like 10 to the fifth power thing. We're, we're done with that. Uh, in fact, what we're actually going to do instead is we're going to attack the seams between where the payment systems and the e-commerce systems kind of link up, right? Because when you're in there, you're going to find out that you need to be very careful when you're rolling your own tokenization. This is actually a very, very hard thing to do just right. So first up, the first attack that we're going to look at is actually something I call malicious insiders versus some tokenization flaws. So let's define a malicious insider first. It's probably somebody that's uh, IT support role, right? So we're talking about a system, network, database administrator, maybe developer. Uh, that person has access to the commerce apps database, uh, which means customer billing info, uh, truncated credit cards like we saw a minute ago, and of course, tokens, right? So, and that person also, kind of as a byproduct of either their role or access to this data, will have knowledge of how this tokenization architecture actually works. So in that case, we're talking about web service APIs, uh, the URLs for those APIs, where they live, right, and maybe even fail and success request logs, right? So they can look at requests and they've got access to how all this stuff works and they've got all of the things on the commerce app side. So in this scenario, the best case is that a malicious insider has to enumerate credit cards equal to that uh, truncated level, right? And this is actually a good thing because if you're guessing 50,000 uh, guesses on average case per credit card record, you're going to find in a, in a real situation, you're going to have validation online, right? You're not going to be just sitting there, oh, I can write some Python code that just generates these, because you're not going to know which of the 50,000 is the right guess, right? So you're going to have end-to-end -end, uh, validation, live transactions against an actual uh, credit card server, right? You're actually sending an auth authorization request across the wire. And then that's where your fraud detection and your throttling comes in. The merchants actually, if you're doing this against a live merchant, the merchant accounts typically get disabled, and the, and the uh, payment clearing houses typically say, hey, you're doing something stupid down there, you need to stop. You know, I've got way too many failed offs. So that's actually best case. So let's talk about the worst case, because this is where we get a little more fun. So worst case scenario, tokenization URLs internet facing. Well, and if we're talking about e-commerce, this is a requirement, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so in this case, the commerce app, you log into it, you've got a, a user account, so you, you've got authenticated access, authorized access inside the app, but when you hop over to actually generate the token at the payment service, the payment service doesn't actually authenticate requests. And this, believe it or not, this is actually very, very typical. I see this all the time. And the question is why? And it's, it's a really simple thing, right? When you're implementing credit card tokenization, you're trying to segment things off and you have this nice clean environment where your payment, uh, your payment data is and this other uh, non-credit card environment where the, uh, the application is and you don't want those two, never sh the two shall mix, right? So you have this physically separated DMZ and it ends up looking something like this, right? So at the top there in the green uh, box, you got store.example.com, and I'm going to refer to these same DNS names throughout the entire talk. So it's store.example.com and payment.example.com. Payment is where the PCI stuff lives. That's where all your rigor and all your audits and all that junk happen, where your two-factor auth happens, and that's where all of the expense is, right? And we want to keep everything out of there because the more things you got in there, the more expensive it is. That's really what it boils down to. So that store.example.com, being in a physically separated DMZ, uh, you have a nice little byproduct if you're not going to share st uh, session state between the two, right? So if I've got an authenticated session against store.example.com, that does not mean that I'm going to be talking to uh, sharing session state with, say, cookies, because we're on a different DNS domain. So, for example, 
when your uh, browser receives a cookie, that cookie is actually usually tied to that the host the, by domain, right? And they're, they're too different, so they're not necessarily going to pass across, or if they're set to the, pa the parent, as you'll see in a little bit, it doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, such a cookie is just one interchange in this scenario. So um, it turns out also that request throttling is basically impossible, as we'll talk about. And that's also very typical in most of these engagements I've been on with, with uh, merchants that are online. Uh, pretty much it's almost impossible to have request throttling. And we'll talk about that in a second. So identifying abusers is actually difficult as a byproduct of this. And this is actually sort of like a design flaw zero day in a sense, because you can literally go on the web right now and the majority of the, the big e-commerce uh, providers that do tokenization like this all pretty much have the same flaw. So let's dig into an example. This is, again, this is based on an actual sanitized uh, retailer. Uh, step one, customer checks out. He's, uh, he's got a, a nice cart built up. He's on store.example.com. Then he goes over, and his browser, usually using JavaScript, you may not even know this is happening. In fact, a good seamless experience, you'll never necessarily even know that it's going on, right? Your, uh, your, the JavaScript logic that's in your browser will go package that credit card up on that credit card form, and it'll send it over to the actual payment service, right? So it looks something like this. Nice JSON request to a RESTful service. In this case, it's uh, post slash API slash generate CC token. This is sanitized off of a real e-commerce app. There were some session cookies there. Of course, in the JSON request came a credit card number, an expiration month, and year. But you know, what's the first thing I would do? Let's try the, to take this same request. Let's repeat it. No session cookies, right? That's the first thing you want to try always as an attacker. Because you'll find out when you send the thing across with no session cookies, you'll get a server response that looks something like this. 200 OK. And there we go. I'll get this nice token request back. I'm assuming that feedback's next door, right? Not me. OK. Um, anyway, so uh, you get this nice token request back. There it is. You can just parse it and do what you need. So notice there's no access denied message, even though there were no cookies on that request. Okay. Basically, you give the server a PAN, a primary account number, and you get back a token. It's really simple. No cookies required. So the question is why? And it comes back down to that different server's different domain thing, right? Uh, there's no sharing of data, because if there's sharing of data, there's something called PCI cooties. That's why I called it this 10, 11 years ago when I was doing PCI work. And it was the only way to really get this, this concept across, right? You don't want these two items to touch. If any session data or anything touches between these two environments, suddenly you've got your, your hosted commerce app is now in scope for PCI, and that defeats the whole purpose of tokenization, in which case, just throw this whole concept away and just let it just handle it end-to-end -end transaction, right? So absolutely have to have them not touch. So PCI cooties, just keep that in your head. So in this worst case, this malicious insider that we defined a minute ago, can just go ahead and he could compute all the possible uh, primary account numbers based on those truncated credit card numbers that we saw, right? So he can do the same thing, write a little Python or whatever, your favorite language, generate those, those, uh, token, those, those pans out there, and then go and after you've got those 50,000 on average, go just iterate through them one at a time, and then submit them anonymously to this payment service, because the endpoint's just out there on the web, right? We, we just saw, didn't take a, didn't require a, a cookie of any kind. Submit them anonymously, and then, of course, um, you get bonus points if you're really engineering and really, really ingenuitive here, and you actually take this, this work and you divide it up across, say, a large uh, botnet, uh, maybe some compromised hosts, and you just kind of like Bitcoin mining kind of style, right? We distribute that workspace out so it's even harder to identify, right? And then, basically, if you get a response, and that response matches the token that the database has already got on file for that, that user that you're trying to steal the credit card from, you win. Right? It's really simple. You guys have all played this game. <laughs> you suck my battleship, right? So I go through, if the response matches, boom, suck my battleship. So why is throttling on the payment uh, server difficult? Well, it comes back to, well, there's no unique cookies, but even if there were unique cookies that are passed over, the, the attacker's just going to throw them away, right? There's no real way to share data across there. I mean, it's, it's difficult. So what if we did something like blocking by IP address? Okay, great. Uh, the first time that you have a corporate customer that tries to make a purchase behind a NATed IP while at work and your company loses revenue, that thing is going away, right? This, this control will never last. So that's not a good idea. Or, you know, a bad guy can just say, okay, we'll be smart and we'll actually just split it out and we'll have, you know, I'll distribute that load across a, a bunch of hosts that are out in the cloud or in a botnet or whatever. Again, splitting a load like Bitcoin mining. Moder uh, mining. So, or you can just uh, slow cook the payment server, right? Where we basically just take these requests and we just submit a few. And if you got a throttle, it doesn't matter. We'll just find out what that threshold is and we'll just submit one less over that period of time. So the question is, how do you really want to solve this? Uh, and the answer comes down to authentication handoff across domain boundaries, or as everyone else knows outside of e-commerce, as federated authentication. This is not a new concept, right? But for some reason, 
uh, adding a little something like an auth token to a, a, uh, a request like this for tokenization services is practically non-existent. It doesn't happen. I, I've, never, I've never seen it. Of course, in the scenario, the auth token actually has to be generated by the Commerce App server, right? So you get so the, so the Commerce App can basically say, "Hey, I've already authenticated John Smith here, and I know this really is him submitting a request over." And this is basically in the old school. Uh, ways of doing this, commerce uh, payment providers, the gateways, would actually uh, issue you basically like an HMAC and you would sign the data elements. So it's actually not really all that new of a concept whatsoever, but yet it's not done. And at the same time, if you are going to implement this, of course, we don't want to implement a JavaScript, right? Because then the attacker can just sit there and unravel all that and, and replicate the logic and just do whatever he needs to do on that side. So that's the first attack. Let's get into some more fun ones, side channels. This is actually uh, my favorite variety. Uh, if you're not familiar with side channels, it's basically an unintended channel of information flow. Uh, basically what you want to do is you want to take something that is otherwise boring and find a one or a zero in the noise. You want to take that noise and extract it out. And uh, again, extra, extra credit homework, if you're going to go home and look at that PCI DSS thing, you can actually get smarter if you go look this up and read up Shannon's Law. Do you have any, any EEs in the room? Anyone with an EE background? None? Disappointed. All right. I, I'm not either, but I happen to know what it is. Anyway, uh, so site channel uh, number one, we're going to talk about some timing attacks. These are actually extremely difficult to prevent, uh, and mostly because we don't train our developers to think this way. Uh, so they, developers never consider the ramifications of them. And uh, the inspiration for this attack is actually going to come from the malicious insiders, again, with the truncated access to, or access to truncated pans, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to have this uh, attack, or it could be an attacker that, say, does an account takeover on a, a popular website. And then goes and say, uh, looks at the saved credit cards on, on file and does it the same way. So step one, we're basically going to take that uh, <clears throat> previously unused primary account number, a whole bunch of them. Maybe we calculate, maybe we generate these. We can actually use this as a tell. Like when, when we're doing tests, we'll actually do this. We'll go to like getcreditcardnumbers.com. Have anyone ever seen that website, getcreditcardnumbers.com? It's not mine. It's a cool one. It'll just generate a bunch of numbers that satisfy the loon check and it'll look like Visa, MasterCard, whatever, Amex. And you can just go grab them. And so what we'll do for things like this, go generate 100, 500, 1,000, 10,000. doesn't matter. It depends on the scale of the site. And we'll just go submit them all, right? And what we do is re record the response times. And then we take that same batch and we submit it through a second time and then compare the response times a second time. And what we do out of that is we get this nice little predictable delta, okay, in response times. And it turns out that almost every single uh, app that we've ever tested that had uh, any kind of uh, anything, any scenario like this, we were able to observe a time difference. It could be time difference one way or the other. It could be that the unused, the cards that had never been seen before were, came back faster. It could be that they came back slower. It just has to do with the logic in there. But basically, you're looking at something like this. If you can read this timing attack example table here, again, it's going back and playing battleship. So what we want to do is we want to submit a bunch of uh, credit cards to it. And when we get a response time that cuts roughly in half, instead of like being 300 milliseconds, we're down to like, say, 100 something, then we know that, hey, man, we just sunk the battleship again. We found that credit card number. That's the one that, it, that matches, so it's the first digits and that check digit or the last four that's all viewable in the, in the, in the, uh, the field there. We submitted the request, we got it back, we noticed the time delta matches the ones that, that basically indicate the, times, the, the payment services, hey, I've seen this card before, we win, right? So the tokenized pans in this case take uh, about half as long to process, probably because the code looks something like this. It's just some mock-up little SUA code, but if you look through here, basically what we're gonna do is you know, generate a hash or generate some kind of a token they go hit that database, look for that. Does it exist? Okay, if it does, return that record. And if it doesn't, we're going to go insert it. Pretty simple, right? So where's the flaw in that? Did anybody see the flaw in that logic? New tokens hit the database twice, and it slows down the response times. Right? So let's look at that again. So if the token is uh, in the database already, we just return the results. If if not, we call out to SQL and hit you know, the database one more time to insert it. So that second. Uh, actual call to SQL is actually where the flaw is. So uh, response time is roughly about 100 milliseconds in this particular example, this particular app that we were testing turns out to be the actual credit card number. That was our tell. So go again, take over the account on the website, right, through session hijacking or whatever means, maybe just go on and stealing a device that's got a logged in session or whatever we want to do. Go get that, that truncated pan, compute all the possible pans, hammer on it because there's no throttling, and then check to see which response back, uh, from the server comes back at about 100 milliseconds. And the one that comes back at 100, boom, we got your credit card number, we stole it. And then what we'll have to do at scale is we just have to compromise multiple accounts at scale, and we can distribute the load through a botnet and everything else. So, pretty cool. Uh, side channel number two is my profile attacks, as I, I like to call them my profile attacks, because almost all websites that you ever have an account on, 
you're going to have a profile, right? So same idea, right? So an attacker steals customer session cookies or grabs your password from the latest, you know, Ashley Madison dump or whatever. Uh, from there, it goes and basically uh, gets into your account and observes the truncated primary account number that's in there. It says, hey, you got a visa, ends in one, 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 one. Okay, great. It's there. What, you know, at this point, developers, uh, almost every single time when we talk about this just as a design problem, all of my developers I've ever talked to say, but our commerce app doesn't even have credit card data and it's just tokenized stuff. That's not our problem. This is, there's no way you can abuse this. Okay? Yeah, okay. So right now, uh, literally you can go out to tons of sites and see this. Uh, big name sites that you have access to, I won't name because we're being recorded, but ones with, uh, say, companies out of Seattle um, actually have this flaw. So you can go uh, basically submit a possible pan that matches that safe credit card number. Again, you know, if it's a visa, you know it starts with so many, there's only so many possible digits that begin that number. It's all out there on the internet for the formula, so you can figure that out. It's a little bit more complexity than 10 to the fifth power when you don't have that beginning, but it's still very, very plausible. Go generate that thing out, uh, get a possible pan, right? Then you go submit that possible pan with the same exact billing account information, of course, because that's present, right? It'll say, you know, John Smith, 123 John Smith Street, Benville, Arkansas, blah, 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 wherever, right? So step two, uh, basically you're gonna look at how many saved payment records you have in your profile. If you had three saved credit cards before you began, you submit a request and now you got four, guess what? You missed, right? That's Battleship again, like you miss, right? But if you're gonna automate this, uh, and the, uh, right here, actually, let me get ahead of myself. So if the count increased by one, obviously you guess wrong. So, but if for bonus points here, if you wanna automate this thing, what you wanna do is when you get that, uh, that miss, you want to go ahead and delete that credit card out of there so you don't actually populate it out. We actually had one app where we were testing and the UI basically broke once you got 50 credit cards saved because there's probably no use case for like maximum number of credit cards somebody can have saved to their, to their account, right? So, but if the account number is the same, the attacker wins, and again, we're back to just like my battleship, right? So I had three credit cards on file, I submit a possible pan, maybe it's, maybe it's request number 50 or 3,000, it doesn't matter. But when I submit that request and I notice, hey man, I, it comes back and I got the same number of payment records I had before, Boom, we got the right one. So the question is, why did that work? And the answer is because we forced the server to, do, to create basically a Boolean logic response, right? Does the credit card exist? Do you already know it or do you not, right? True or false? So the question is, how do we solve it? Um, the thing that I tell developers is, hey, uh, what you wanna do is actually always add a new save pay payment record to this case, right? We teach developers not to do this kind of thing, right? We teach them to be efficient, uh, don't, don't ever repeat yourself, don't ever duplicate data. We don't want to clog the database and everything else, right? You don't want to add another a payment record because their logic goes and says, hey man, I've already inserted this in the database, why would I go create a second one? So, but hey, if, even if the billing info and the pan and everything matches all the way out, create a new billing, uh, create a new payment method anyway because then obfuscates whether or not you got the right one or not, right? It doesn't matter on the back end for processing which ID in the database you're actually pointing at because the end, end result's still the same, you'll get paid. So typically this is actually implemented on the tokenization server, it's not on the commerce app at all, um, but that's okay. So anyway, so yeah, just basically don't worry about your, your record efficiency whatsoever. So side channel number three is uh, helpful headers. How many of you have a restful service geek in your organization? And I know there's gotta be a, at least a dozen hands. You got that guy who's all into it, and if you don't do it precisely, uh, you know, all the way to the fullest definition of RESTful services and they're not happy with the implementation, right? It's not, it can't be just JSON or whatever. It's got to have the HTTP verbs and you got to use all the response codes. I only saw like one or two hands. Is it because we're after launch and we need to get the blood flowing or no? No one? No one? Okay, I've apparently worked with too many uh, RESTful ser service geeks and uh, in my past I find out that they absolutely love their status codes. So things like this, 200 okay, 201 created, 202 accepted, all that, right? Like they like to have all of them. Most of us only know there's about four or five, like, you know, 404 not found, 401 unauthorized, 500 server error. There's, there's only a handful that we're really aware of, but it turns out there's like tons of them and they can be very nuanced in what they mean and restful service geeks like to, well, I need to return this. That way the, can, the you know, developer on the other end, when he's writing the consumer to my service, can understand the nuance and then know therefore to be, you know, his code can do, you know, X. Okay, great but the bad guy can know that too. So what if we have a token request where the response back says, hey, 201 created versus 200 okay? What did that just tell us? Just like the other services we're talking about, that status code indicated a token match, right? 201 created, boom. That's a brand new, a brand new token. I've never seen that credit card before. So if I'm hammering on the same, same site and I'm, I'm trying to see if, I've got, if I can guess this, uh, 
this full 16-digit number out of that truncated pan that's sitting there on the save profile, and I get a 201 created, that means I missed, right? Back to the battle, uh, battleship analogy. If I get a 200 okay, that means I absolutely hit it. So, <clears throat> careless uh, tokenization software bugs. We love our software bugs. I've actually tested some apps where the, uh, the browser just suddenly submitted a pan to the wrong place, right? For some reason, I noticed I'm look, looking through my burp history, boom, wait, my full 16-digit credit card number for my test account. Test account went to the actual e-commerce site and not to the payment site. And some sitting here thinking, like, what in the world just happened, right? So uh, looking into it, it's almost always JavaScript bugs, typically because there's a big uh, pile of code and the developer doesn't understand all the widgets or all the scenarios in that code. Uh, there could be some edge cases that don't get tested out, uh, as we'll dig into here in a minute. And I find it's really, really common with classic uh, ASP.NET, ASP.NET web forms, the ASPX pages, uh, mostly because if you're, um, if you have anyone with a dev background here, you'll know that there's a lot of controls, ajax -E controls. So ASP.NET web forms is all predates all the, the web 2.0 stuff, and they try to sort of shim and stuff in there. And then there's these partial page updates, so you feel like you're kind of getting this fresh, you know, very, very responsive kind of a, kind of a feel. But at the same time, it turns out that a lot of those controls will send everything that's in the form. Okay. This example is based, again, off a real live website that really existed. And I know it's hard to read up here because you got a lot of text in there, but basically this was a, uh, an address verification service. So big long form required, you know, put your credit card number in here, your billing address and all that stuff. And then when you put your address in and you tabbed off of it, there was something neat in there that just said, hey, I'm going to go verify that the address is actually, you know, in the postal service and that's, that's legit and we make sure we're actually, you know, sending the product to the right place, right? So it, boom, just, hey, the control is like, hey, I'm an ASP.NET generic control. I'm not aware that I'm on a tokenization page whatsoever. I'll just grab every single form field, thank you very much, and I'll throw it over to the server, right? Well, here's the deal. This technically suddenly makes that entire commerce app, if its goal of doing tokenization is to take it out of scope, suddenly brings it all on the PCI scope. Why? Because that credit card number just went to the wrong place, right? It just touched the commerce server, which means it's in RAM, and you've got all of that, that litany of stuff that you need to do now applies. So, oops, right? That's a big bad problem, right? So, um, if you are ever familiar with this one, friends don't let friends do post back. If you got any ASP.NET developers in the room, uh, you don't uh, basically switch to MVC. I think that's the idea here. Another example wasn't ASP.NET, uh, but it was just some homegrown JavaScript. It was sitting there listening to on key press events in JavaScript. So uh, the intent of this little functionality was basically to determine the card type. So rather than have a user click that little drop down box and say Visa, MasterCard, Amex, whatever it was, uh, we're just going to have something that goes and sits and looks at the first four to six digits and figure out that, that bank identifier number and just automatically pre-populate that. When I was looking at this, I thought to myself, why in the world they didn't implement this on the server side and not even prompt them? If you're just going to look at that data, just have that logic on the server side. But whatever, it, I wouldn't have this slide if it wasn't for that. So um, <clears throat> this is what happened. So you'd get this nice little post, basically, that say, hey, slash API, slash CC type. Here is the CC prefix. Okay, 411111. Well, that's a little bit longer than a prefix, right? So what happened, I noticed, is that every single time you pressed a key press, at least in my test browser, Every key press sends something like this, 4, 4, 1, 4, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1, 1, and then boom, 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 and then eventually, the whole thing. whole thing went across, minus the last digit. For some reason, the logic failed. It'll take the first 15 on that 16 digit. No, 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 no. We don't need to check it anymore. We can now just post it directly to the, to the tokenization server, right? So another example. Uh, we had an app where, you know, so the way that most of these work is you obviously have a form tag inside of HTML. Get your nice form that says, give me your credit card, payment details, address, blah, 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 blah. Um, what happened is the form actually didn't have an action defined. Anybody know what happens when an action is not defined on a form? And you hit submit. It goes back to the original host server, right? So they actually had this nice little JavaScript reference in the page, script source equals blah, whatever that URL was. That URL came in there, went and found that form by, by name or ID, and said, okay, I'm going to redirect your target over here to my payment server. Uh, in the browser at runtime, like, psh, you're going to send that, that form over here. Well, something accident, I mean, like this was total serendipity, right? JavaScript failed to load and execute. I, uh, at the time, I'm thinking, it I don't know if it was a timeout, or it was a proxy issue, or it was a DNS issue, or the server was just busy, or some, something happened, and that little JavaScript didn't load in my browser just right. Otherwise, I never would have even really thought about this at the time. 
And boom, what happened is I submitted that, hit the submit button, and then I looked back at Burp and I thought, what in the world? The whole credit card number just went back to the commerce server again. It's a nice little fail. Uh, how many of you guys have DevOps in your organizations? All right. How many of you don't know what DevOps is? Okay. I was just checking. Wait, 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 wait. I need to ask David. Negative. How many of you know what DevOps is? There, we got more. Okay. Just make sure blood's flowing. Um, so, what if you have a malicious DevOps admin? This is an, a scenario that always bugs me. Um, I've yet to actually have a scenario where I've been allowed to test for this, but this is a this is interesting nonetheless. So, tokenization, as you've seen, obviously relies on a lot of stuff on the browser, right? We got to have the browser indicate where that credit card goes because that's the user's data and it can't go back to the commerce app. So, JavaScript in the browser. Uh, one really neat thing about that is that it doesn't require a build and deploy, right? Like in the old days, you got a Java app, you got a .NET app, you got, shoot, even uh, if you're still running CGI bin with like C, you're going to have a build server that packages that code up. You know, the developer makes their changes, it builds it, tests it locally, right? Pushes it out to the build server in the repo. The repo then, you know, it automates this build and pushes out to the server, uh, to the actual deployment server, and it gets tested and then actually adapts to the production, right? So you get all these steps that are there, these safety nets to make sure that you don't screw up your code and don't, you know, uh, open up your environment to something really bad. Turns out the JavaScript is a script, right? It's not compiled, so we can actually make edits right on the server. So what if a malicious DevOps admin decides, hey, I'm just going to insert a few lines or I'm going to modify some lines of code in that JavaScript file? So the question I've got for you guys is, how many of you guys have integrity checking on the JavaScript files in your web group and your web apps today? I've never, ever seen anyone do this. So think about that. So you got, and especially if you're in a, in a really agile environment with continuous integration, and you're constantly pushing out changes, your devs are doing releases, say, you know, 100 times a month, which is, you know, insane, right, three times a day. Uh, there are some shops that do that. So how is anyone ever going to notice? Especially if you've got a really, really large scale app and you've got, say, 100 nodes on the front end of the web server that's hosting this content. So let's just say we're going to do something really evil, like we're going to modify the JavaScript and we're just going to say, hey, we're going to take this, uh, this copy of this data, we're going to grab out of this particular form field where, the, where it lives, and we're just going to insert you know, one or two lines of JavaScript that just go grab that, and then we're just going to post it over here to evil.com. And then, of course, we'll handle the natural redirect back to payment.example.com so that the user doesn't know the difference, the payment server gets their credit card, and everybody's happy, right? The, the customer gets their product shipped to them, the whole deal is done. With uh, JavaScript, obviously, uh, like I said, there's no continuous integration builds required, so uh, what, if, what if we had like an intentional defect? Same scenario, but a little bit more subtle. So what if we have a developer that uh, intentionally introduces some kind of a defect on the server and then says, hey, you know what, I'm going to start doing some kind of weird logging with it. Um, what if they say, hey, you know, it's, it's Cyber Monday and I'm going to put in a change control request to profile a process on a production web front end? So that brings up the question, RAM scraping, right? So RAM scraping is not just for point of sale systems. Everyone's heard of RAM scraping, right, by now that we referenced the other retailers and stuff on the slides this morning. Um, so obviously er everyone, in my mind at least, uh, associates RAM scraping with point of sale, with physical brick and mortar. But if your web server accepts primary account numbers, or if your web server accidentally accepts them, right, because there's a JavaScript flaw, like the examples we talked about here, that means those credit card numbers actually live in RAM. If your web server decrypts primary account numbers because they came encrypted in some way, that means primary account numbers live in RAM. And the thing that will probably blow your mind is if you actually ran a test on this, you'd find that uh, modern languages like Java and uh, ASP.NET it's actually going to live there for minutes or hours. Minutes or hours. Most people think, when I first got into doing RAM scraping attacks, I thought, okay, it's a race condition. So we're going to do physical brick and mortar retail. I'm going to swipe the credit card. Okay, run, run, the, run the profile dump, right? And let, let's go look at the process and see and immediately grep it. And did I get what I wanted out of there? And then, you know, what happened is the first time I did it, I went, okay, real quick, boom, hit enter. 17 copies of that, that mag stripe data. What? What happened? And what turns out is most code constructs are actually use what's called an immutable string. And an immutable string means I'm going to take that, that, out, uh, that, that data, whatever it is, and if I pass it off to another function in the stack of calls, every single function down in that stack is going to get a new copy of it. Right? That's just a, that's a, that's a nature that's built in Java, uh, .NET, um, and a lot of the high-level languages. Right? So when they do that, those are allocated on the heap. And you think, oh, well, garbage collection is going to come get it. Okay, good luck with that. Your garbage collection will come and get it like in an hour. 
So when people think, oh, I need, you know, you think about these uh, malware attacks on point of sale, I'm going to go and run RAM scraping and I'm sitting there in, in, you know, in real time just scraping. Nope, turns out, you know, I can just sit there and I can just pull like once a minute, every two minutes, every 10, and I can still get enough of the data back that you just, you'd be shocked. So beware of the DevOps admin that says, hey, I need to profile the service, especially on Cyber Monday, right? And that's it. We flew through these slides. Got any questions? Uh, default with garbage collection? Yeah, d gar garbage collection by default, basically it's at the whim. You can kind of, in some places you can kind of automate it, but basically what you're doing is you can say, hey, garbage collection, I got trash. You want to come pick it up? And it'll say, hey, man, it's Friday. Maybe. Or I'll get it, I'll, I'll get over to it. You know, you know, go away. You know, most of them are not going to be very responsive at all. Most of them don't do it. What they really do is they optimize that call because that's expensive, right? To go take all the memory and then reshape it and then overwrite it. So most of what they do is they actually go and say, okay, I'm going to mark the space available for use. Thanks for telling me about it. I see that this reference to this memory location is no longer valid. It's gone. That function terminated and exited. So I'll just, I'll just hang on to this. And the next time I'm actually pressed for, you know, memory space, I'll remember that it's here and I'll overwrite it. That's usually what it does. So it can just sit there for a really, really long time. Any other questions? How many people want to go out and buy stuff right now? <laughs> cool. All right, well, I'm going to give you back some time. If you have other questions, you can come hit me up. Uh, my name's Tim, and thank you very much for your time today. And also, thank you very much to the uh, to the crew for putting this on. This is uh, I've been pretty impressed. I know there's a lot of first-timers here, but the conference crew uh, has done a phenomenal job. I mean, there's obviously a great audience, a great talks lineup. So good round of applause to all those guys, right?